Good evening, Internet Explorers. Well, I guess rest in peace to the original browser, but hiya folks, I'm Alexa, the resident nooky spooky girly, and I hope y'all are ready to do some exploring today. Well, I've never really ventured into too many abandoned buildings myself for a number of reasons. They do fascinate me, and you know, I had a heck of a time researching for today. Let me know in the comments if you've ever explored somewhere abandoned. And here are the top five horrifying discoveries found in abandoned buildings. In fifth place, we have the Krampnitz Eagle. Alrighty, time for the usual disclaimers, because the tube that is you does not like people chatting about all things World War II, so this girlie has to be kinda goofy to get around that and get my point across. We're gonna chat about the bad guys, whose name starts with an N, but I'll be referring to them as Yahtzees. If you have an issue with that, take it up somewhere else. I've just gotta follow the interweb rules. Krampnitz in Germany was used as a cavalry training center during the First World War, and then as a motorized vehicle barracks by the uh, bad German guys during the Second World War, housing motorbikes, tanks, and armored vehicles. When the Russians took Berlin, the Germans fled, handing themselves over to the British and US forces rather than be captured by the Red Army, who soon claimed Krampnitz as their own. Yahtzee imagery, especially with the uh, big bad symbol, whose name starts with an S, was banned in Germany after the war, and rightfully so. I know it wasn't originally a big bad symbol, I'm quite informed on the history of it and the name and different pronunciations, but trust me, that's just the easiest way to get my point across. I think I'm doing enough dancing around words right now, I don't want to make anyone's head spin, least of all my own. Examples in public places were destroyed, and it is still illegal to display them outside of authorized exhibitions. However, at Krampnitz, this original and painstakingly crafted mosaic inlaid with gold leaf remained for decades. Some speculated the Russians may have kept it as a trophy of sorts, explaining its remarkable survival. But it remained there even after the Russians finally abandoned the site in 1992. The Krampnitz eagle appears to have been the very last genuine example of its kind. It was a haunting reminder of the reality of humanity's darkest days. It was eventually destroyed in the mid-2010s, and while I don't believe that Yahtzee stuff should be paraded about, it is kind of a shame that such intricate art has been lost to time. In fourth place, we have pickled creatures. It reminds me of right after high school, when I was helping to clean out my grandma's basement and found jars of pickled unknowns that had been pickled like before I was born. I was very grateful that none of the jars were open or broken, because who knows what they had turned into by that point. Boarding is genetic, and I am determined to break the chain of women from that side of my family tree, drowning in belongings. Alrighty, back on track for now, I promise. Blame my ADHD. Anderlecht Veterinary College in Brussels was built in 1912 in a pretty Belgian neo-renaissance style, but left abandoned in 1991 when the whole campus moved location to the eastern Belgian town of Liège. Gosh, neo-renaissance architecture is so stunning, don't you think? Feel free to let me know in the comments what your favorite architecture style is. It could be a fun debate. The various buildings, which once contained pens for cattle and cages for primates and other mammals, were gradually converted, but one remained empty long after the others. Upstairs was a grand lecture hall complete with rows of plush, red, theater-like chairs, while beautiful marble staircases and brass banisters adorned the other floors. The kind of place you know you just want to marvel at and curl up in, just to imagine lives that came before yours. Down in the basement, however, lurking in a dark and long disused room were hundreds of macabre specimens of animals preserved in glass jars. I'm talking baby pigs, cows, and even parts of dogs, cats, and horses were among them. I'm glad my research elaborated on part of, because for a moment I was trying to picture a container large enough to hold a horse, and it was uh, kinda terrifying. Jawbones, internal organs, and some whole animals all waited to greet any unsuspecting explorer, with their glassy, faded eyes staring out through the yellowish tint of formaldehyde. Uh. Good old formaldehyde. Some were smashed and laid rotting on tables and floors, making for a truly bizarre and disturbing sight, especially down there in the darkness, and only lit by torchlight. Also, imagine the smell. Okay, moving on before I gag from my overactive imagination taking over. In third place, we have a mummified body. Okay, Alexa, you can do it. You can fight the urge to hurl. Back in August of 2022, police in Milwaukee were asking for the public's help in identifying a man whose body was found in an abandoned building, and yep, you guessed it, most of the body was mummified. The remains were found on August 10th at 231 West Burley Street. Apparently the body was found by a YouTuber, but no clue as to who it might have been. Amy, the lead forensic investigator at the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office, said the body had no identification on it. The medical examiner's office said a majority of the remains were mummified, except for the head, feet, and one hand. Because of the mummification, the medical examiner's office was able to identify tattoos in the body and submit them into a database. According to an investigation report from that examiner's office, the building was a multi-use building, with a church on the first floor and rooms upstairs, but had long been abandoned according to that report. Now, this spokesperson said the person appears to be a black male, based on the features discovered in the autopsy. The body also had tattoos and five rings on the fingers. One of the tattoos on the left arm says King, and another on the right arm has the letters S-A-V-A. -A. The body had further tattoos 
tattoos, but they were too hard for investigators to distinguish. The man was also wearing a red allergy bracelet that was, you know, commonly used in hospitals. According to officials, the man had on multiple layers of clothing, including athletic pants and long underwear. He was also wearing what appeared to be like two jackets, so lots of layers. According to the autopsy report, from what they could tell, he didn't really have any injuries, and there was no signs of drug use. Fun fact: bodies left in hot, you know, freezing environments can typically mummify in about two weeks, while the process typically takes a couple of months in enclosed locations. Remains in mild environments take about three months. When a person dies, the countdown to decomposition begins, as digestive enzymes start breaking down cells inside the body. In most cases, enzymes need to be in an aqueous environment to work. So if the fluids are removed, decomposition slows down. During spontaneous mummification, the body loses water more rapidly than the enzyme's destructive actions can operate. Bodies buried in crypts can accidentally mummify if ventilation, you know, is a thing. Not every part of the body mummifies at the same time though. Like some internal organs, like the heart, take a lot longer to dry out. Which makes sense. Whereas the hands, toes, and um, scrotum are among the fastest body parts to dry out. Like I said before, the environment can speed up the uh, process, often through extreme temperatures or pH levels that slow down the enzyme activity. Sometimes the soil surrounding the body plays a big part as well, either through osmosis or because heavy metals in the dirt can uh, impede the enzymes. Even clothes can help mummification, because they act as a wick that absorbs bodily fluids from the skin. In addition to protecting the remains from the body's process of decomposing, the environmental conditions also have to defend against external threats like bacteria, fungi, and animals in order to ensure that a mummy will last. Figured that would all be worth learning about, because why not? Am I still queasy? Sure, but it was worth it. In second place, we have the Haunted Crane Mirror. So dating back to 1833, St. Bridget's Asylum in Ireland is among the oldest surviving examples of such buildings. It first opened its doors in, yep, 1833 as the Connacht District Lunatic Asylum, and was considered one of the earliest of the Irish District Asylums, hailing a new, progressive role in mental health for Ireland, stating that it would care for the curable lunatics. I know that's out of date terminology, but it's a direct quote from history, not my own words. Hey, under that hospital standards, I fall under that category myself. Until recent history, ADHD was something people could grow out of, and that was something I was taught as a kid. I more so grew into mine, but that's not our point today. With the deinstitutionalization of mental health and the constant overcrowding, St. Bridget's Psychiatric Hospital was forced to close its doors in 2013. Designed in a prison-like radial plan from grim gray stone, by the 1920s it was grossly overcrowded, designed originally for 840 patients but holding almost 1,500. Sadly, this was the norm for many institutions, and not the exception. While many started off as well-meaning, and this was, you know, all over the world, demand was just too high and the pressure to overfill was given in too. So there are five main styles of asylum design. The corridor, pavilion, echelon, colony, but I'll elaborate more on the radial plan I mentioned for this place. The radial plan saw the long wings of the asylum radiate outwards from a central point, thus reflecting the style of prisons of that era. This style was considered inhumane even in its day, due to the lack of natural light, circulation of air, and space for airing courts. So okay, maybe this specific asylum never had good intentions. Like all good mysteries, the crane mirror discovered in one of the rooms by urban explorers posed some intriguing questions. Standing alone in an otherwise unremarkable room, with its strange seashell motif and intricate dancing carved wooden cranes, it stood around 12 feet tall and suggested something perhaps more at home in a ballet school. But in the 19th century, and within an asylum, that explanation seemed most unlikely. Larger than any door or window in that room, I kind of wonder how they even managed to get it in there. But also why go to such trouble? Was it some sort of strange passion project installed at the request of a former medical superintendent? Could there really have been ballet classes in an asylum, or was it part of some strange type of therapy? Perhaps it covered up like a doorway or something else hidden behind it? And if so, what? No satisfactory answer has yet been found. Explorers have mentioned that that specific room felt ice cold when they were in it, almost as if some sort of spirit had attached themselves to the area. Which sounds accurate to me. While they couldn't find a death rate for the asylum, just assume it was high, and at least some poor soul passed there when they shouldn't have. I feel like I'm forgetting something. That'll come to me. Oh right, a different urban explorer found an old abandoned coffin sitting alone in the basement, which she thankfully discovered was empty. Personally, I don't think I would have dared open the thing. I'm too disgusted by what could be, and fearful of curses, but all the power to her. In first place, we have the West Park Asylum Brain Matter. Time to travel to another asylum, West Park Asylum, and this time to the abandoned mortuary and pathology labs, which sat nestled among the trees in a corner of the site. It had once been tucked away behind the asylum's chapel, but that was demolished back in the 1980s to make way for a staff car park, because priorities. Parking over history. Being home to up to 2,545 patients, death visited the asylum regularly, and the mortuary fridges had room for up to 12 bodies to be stored at any one time. Something about that ratio makes me think the more it got overfilled quite a bit. One could wander the shabby abandoned wards of the asylum after closure and read the old logbooks that described patients dying in the night or after a fall or injury. 
Fluid and tissue samples were taken from some patients and stored in boxes or on glass slides, including chunks of brain, sealed in paraplast blocks, which is a waxy paraffin based substance for uh, later study. Being unmarked, no one knows who they once belonged to, what they died of, or what lessons might have been learned from them. Anything that remained would have been eventually thrown away or burned, along with all the other fascinating artifacts this crazy asylum once contained. I'm both fascinated and grossed out by this. Not sure which side is winning. And that brings us to the end of our time, and uh, I think I'm definitely horrified. Talking about mental institutions takes a lot out of me mentally, but not intended. I hope you all enjoyed today's deep dive, and if you did, could you all help us out with a like, subscribe if you aren't already, and uh, hit the bell for more from us here at Top 5 Scary Videos, and I'll see you all next time you lovely spooky people.